send us your best players. So we did, and they played against this thing, and the humans crushed their AI. Two years later, they issued the same challenge, and this time the machine crushed the humans. Thank you very much for that welcome, and uh, yeah, thanks for coming along to this talk. So I'm Dominic Wallerman. I'm um, a science communicator now. My background's physics, and I've got um, a YouTube channel called Domain of Science, and I write kids' books about science called Professor Astrocat. I'm joined with, by Liv. Would you like to introduce yourself as well? Uh, yeah, hi, I am Liv Barry. Uh, also with a background in physics originally, um, although I then got into poker through a very roundabout way through game shows. Uh, and ended up playing that professionally for about 12 years. Um, and then simultaneously got very interested in philanthropy, which got me interested in the concept of uh, global catastrophic risk uh, and have become kind of a sort of also a science communicator on uh, the intersection of game theory and risk um, and technology. And I guess that's what's led us yeah. here. So um, I guess, AI, its potential and its risks. I want to start off in your field, which is poker. So we've, we've had a series of AI being able to beat humans at things that we, would, we thought we were uniquely good at. First chess, and then go, and then poker, uh, in that order. So um, how does it work if an AI is competing in poker? Is it literally a, a camera? Is it reading your facial gestures and things like that? Could you describe that? Because I don't understand. Yeah. Um, so right now, the AIs that we have um, that are technically sort of superhuman and that they are better than any other poker player, any human poker player on Earth, um, they purely, the reason they're so good is that they are better at calculating uh, what's called the game theory optimal solutions um, to the game. Uh, so they're not using any of that kind of meta information that, right. you know, if we were playing poker against each other right now, there's all kinds of different bits of information we're, we're processing. Get tells. Right. There's, the, the, there's the, like, physical stuff, like the way your body is moving, uh, the words that you're saying, you know, your heart rate, your breathing, all that, like, reading the vibes, basically. Um, and then there's also the sort of more, like, core information, which is, uh, you know, what... How much did you bet when this particular card came out? Um, what odds am I being laid? Uh, the, the sort of more like mathematical stuff, yeah. essentially. And right now, the AIs that we have are only processing on the, you know, they're only using that, that level of information, the mathematical stuff. And yet, that is sufficient to beat the best human on Earth. Um, now, obviously, with a game like poker, how many of you know how to play poker out of interest? OK. so. I'll give a quick explainer actually how it works. But poker, because people often think it's like blackjack, you know, there's like many decks of cards and it's about remembering, remembering the cards, it's not. It's you're playing against other humans um, and you basically have these chips that you bet um, in order to, based on what you think your relative strength of your cards are compared to your opponents. Um, but you can also bluff, you know, so you can win by having the best hand, but you can also win by making your opponent think you have the best hand when you don't. Um, and the deck is shuffled between every hand. So there's no sort of memorization in that regard. But you can memorize, um, you can start to pick up and learn people's behaviors. Some players play very um, timidly. You know, they're very risk averse and cautious. Some players are very aggressive. Um, some are downright insane, etc. But what this, these AIs are, are doing, basically, you know, the way poker works, it's, it's fundamentally a mathematical game at its core. And there are strategies that you can develop where if you play that strategy, um, you cannot be exploited by your opponents. And these AIs are so good at doing that. They, they're, they're better at, than any human brain at getting close to this kind of, um, it's a very sort of mathematically complex strategy. And that's all they are doing. Mm. Um, and still they're better than us. Right, so you can't bluff an AI. Well, so you can bluff, um, definitely. It's just that it's, and now we're going to get really, it's very nitty gritty, but basically to play this like game theory optimal style of poker, it's all about like randomizing in the right sort of frequencies. Oh, okay. So like a top poker player, funny enough, like let's say, you know, the, your goal of poker is to maximize your deception. 
You want to be as deceptive as possible and not give any useful information to your opponent while meanwhile, in the meantime, extracting as much information out of them that you can. And so to maximize deception, you actually want to use randomness in your strategy. So in certain situations, like 30% of the time, I will play um, you know, the, these, these particular cards very aggressively, and 70% of the time I'll play them passively. And it's these ratios and knowing which ratios to use in these different situations. And there are so many thousands and thousands of possible situations. That's what the computers, these, these AIs are able to compute better than people. So if uh, AI poker, you ended up having, say, a robot with facial gestures and literally moving the cards around and stuff like that, it would still be as good, or would it add or subtract anything? Like, what would it? Be? Would that change anything? Well, I, I mean, that would be a fun thing, I guess. Build a ro robot that is physically playing. But the thing is, is the thing that gives information away when you're playing against people is their emotions. Like, we, we care about losing our money. Mm. That's what is motivating us. Or we, we don't want to look stupid. Uh, or we want to enact vengeance because someone did a, you know, ran a big bluff on us a few hands before. Um, so we have these emotions which, you know, which show up physiologically. Yeah. And they can make us make silly mistakes. Uh, these machines don't have these emotions. They don't, you know, I mean, they have a sort of optimization function, which is maximize the number of chips won per you know, unit time, um, but do they, you know, maybe they get upset and maybe you could program in some kind of emotion that a robot would show. What does this mean for, I suppose, what's the future of poker? And then also what I want to ask is, for us humans, like, do you think that we're special in any way, but going from chess to go to poker to then writing to then drawing art, is there anything special will eventually AI be able to do everything that a human can do? Like, where do you, where do you see it? Like, obviously we don't know now, right. but where do you see it? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. Um, I assumed, you know, so the way it happened in poker with AI, in 2015, they sent uh, a team at Carnegie Mellon, sort of sent a, a, a challenge to the poker world saying, we think we built a superhuman AI at this particular format of one-on-one -on -one poker. Send us your best players. So we did, and they played against this thing, and the humans crushed their AI. So we were like, okay, yeah. We, poker is such a complex game. It's even more complex than Go in terms of like, you know, computationally. Um, so it's years away. Two years later, they issued the same challenge, and this time the machine crushed the humans. Two years after that, they did it for uh, an even more complex format, which is with six players. You know, so it's like the decision tree so it, like, explodes. And again, this like absolutely crushed the humans, and it did it on a like a thousand x less training time in terms of like compute. So like you can just like intuitively feel this like exponential graph right. of, of progress. It's in, it's mad. So yeah, so like you're seeing like more and more like computationally complex things become dominated. You know, as as you know, and I'm not an expert in algorithm and design of these things, um, but I always assumed that something like art would be forever untouchable. Right, or at least a long, long way away. That would be one of the last bastions to fall. Yes, creativity. Right. Because that was the narrative for a while that the league, like lawyers might get replaced because it's very sort of computational in that there are rules mm -hmm. about what is, yeah, but, but art and creativity. So I think what it is, is the reason why art was actually surprisingly easy to do um, is because art is, it walks that fine line between like order and chaos in order to be beautiful. And that means, you know, for chaos, basically, you can have errors. So the reason why something like self-driving is such a hard problem is because you can't have really any error rate, right? It needs to be like 99.9999% reliable. Whereas for creating an image of a, you know, a, a sunset at night, like those little quirks and foibles that might be like actual errors, technically, in what the AI is trying to do, look nice. You know, we like it when a painter has like their flair and so on. It's like, that's what gives us this like quirk. Now, is it that therefore beauty is like quantifiable and mathematical? I don't know. I, I kind of, something in me wants to resist that idea. I think that there maybe is something intangible, but. So there's, well, there, there's an element where if you're, if an AI is producing art, it's trained on all the art that's made by humans. So it's not actually being creative and generating something. They're, technically it is new because it's new combinations of stuff. But like to be, I think we think of, it's uniquely human to 
create something which no one else has created before, have an insight, some kind of insight. Mm. Do you think that's outside of the bounds of AI? I feel like it's probably not. Um, I mean, you're sort of getting into this topic of like emergent properties, right? Can Whether our brains are just very right. sophisticated statistical machines. Right. I mean, like if you look at sort of, because arguably, you know, when Van, Van Gogh was probably iterating on a previous art that he had seen, but he's adding something new to it, a brand new style or something like that. You know, I think it's very hard to say that any human is creating a brand new piece of art that has never been, you know, they've grown up in a culture. And so anything a human creates is a sort of uh, coming out of their cultural upbringing. Everything's a reason. So it's all, everything is sort of interconnected. Yeah. And so I don't think it's necessarily fair to say that because AI is using other people's art to like create new things, it's not creativity. Um, but going back to your question is like, is there anything that will be like forever untouchable? Um, again, this is just my gut. So sure. it'd be very yeah, wrong. Well, um, I feel like there's like, there's certain things like, the connection between a mother and a child, you know, or just th there's like this little, like, can you simulate that? Can you emulate that? I don't know. You know, I, 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 I'm curious, I guess it'd be interesting to find that out. But I think if there's, if there's anything that's just like truly not going to be touchable, it's going to be this sort of like human connection stuff. You know, that said, we're seeing AI friend bots mm. appearing and like, there may be a use for that. Like if truly people are struggling for connection, you know, I'm very on the fence of like, are these things good or not? That's simulating these things like support and love and therapy. I don't know. I mean, if we're in a scarce environment where people who need therapy can't get it any other way, then that's probably better than nothing. Yeah. But is it really going to replace, you know, like we're having this conversation face to face. There's probably all kinds of information being back, passed back and forwards that we're not even really aware of. Yeah. But like my suspicion why social media is such a like hostile place is because it's this very narrow band of communication. It's missing all this other stuff that you get when you're in person with someone. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.